Welcome, Rabbi. How are you? Good. Just listening to the conversation. Good morning, everybody. Well, unless you, unless you give us good, it, it seems to be about food and scholastic stuff. Uh, by the way, I was kidding about the church being spiritual Israel. Rabbi. I think every religion has the right to kind of carve out their own theology. Who's to complain? I'm not trying to enter a Christian heaven. I'm happy in a Jewish heaven. I think you're allowed to create your own heaven also and exclude the people you want to exclude and include. It's like a club. It's like a clubhouse. We have freedom when it comes to carving out religions. I can exclude Nate. That'd be sweet. This universalistic understanding of heaven and hell, let people create their own heaven and hell. I'm sure Christian doesn't want to be in a Catholic heaven or a Catholic want to be in a, in a Christian hell. It's interesting. Most rabbis, if you ask them to describe the afterlife or the world to come, They'll say that you're in a room learning Torah all day with a bunch of rabbis. It doesn't sound too pleasurable to me. I got a question for you, Rabbi. Why in the Old, in the Old Testament it condemned uh, idolatry so much? Because it's foreign worship. From my perspective, it's because it's a waste of time. Not because God is actually warring against his other God or God is actually jealous. He's trying to help us conserve our time and our energy and not waste it on anything futile. Lou, did you have a response? Did you hear enough of that? to respond it's about conservation yeah I, I heard I, I heard what he said I, I just don't see what he said in, in the Old Testament but um which I find very interesting at least you would hold to what it says right there's a distinction between what appears in the Torah and then in the prophets and in the writings so the prophets we know is reactionary clearly it's going to be trying to bring Israel back to proper observance because you won't have prophets unless Israel's misbehaving. In the Torah, you also don't hear a lot about foreign gods. What about? Um, but in the prophets. What about when they try to build the calf? That's like one or twice, maybe three times. So how, how was the response? How did God respond at that time? What do you think? What are, you, what are your thoughts on that? God was upset mainly because they were attributing the Exodus to some foreign deity, and in this case, a cow. So, uh, and, so doing and that so is wrong is what you're saying? Yeah, for sure. <laughs> oh, it is wrong. Because I heard you be saying before that we all have different, you know, the rabbis just sitting. Heaven is a whole bunch of rabbis sitting around and you, know, you can make up your own heaven. Jewish Bible doesn't speak about heaven or hell, at least literally. There may be some foreshadowings here and there. In other words, there's no commandment to try to get into heaven or a commandment to stay out of hell from a Jewish perspective. Well, I don't know if I'd agree with that. I mean, <laughs> that's not even, I would say from your perspective, I mean... I know, I know I can go back and find different writings on this that very specifically talk about the ability of condemnation. So, uh, a lot yeah, of we're not the Jewish kids. Bible, at least. There's so when you say the Jewish Bible, what are you referring to? Because I'm Jewish, and I know rabbis that would disagree with you on this. So we know that Sheol doesn't literally mean hell. We know Gehenna doesn't literally mean hell. We know Shemayim doesn't mean heaven, at least like some sort of spiritual place. I do believe in a heaven and a hell, but I don't think the Bible expects me to believe in one. It seems like our patriarchs did the right thing for the sake of doing the right thing. Nowadays, people don't want to lift a finger unless they're promised heaven or kept out of hell. I think that's part of the dumbification of theology. Rabbi, I'm really interested in more about the Jewish heaven or afterlife than just in a, being in a room learning the Torah from rabbis. Well, that's just one opinion. <laughs> That's just one opinion. There's another opinion that heaven and hell are the same place. And this is tied to folklore and legend, what's called Midrash Nagada. So they'll say that uh, in one place, with all this food in front of them, people have pieces of wood tied to their arms so that and they won't be able to feed themselves. So they feel they're in hell. But in the other room right next door, they're in a similar situation, but they're feeding each other. No one really knows. There's nothing definitive in the Jewish world regarding heaven and hell just because there's so much written about it outside of the, the Torah, I mean, mainly in Kabbalah. In the in the writings and the prophets, would they be on the same par in terms of authority as the Torah? No, not at all. We don't even consider the books of the prophets or the writings the word of God. The word of God is revelation, what we received on Mount Sinai. Now, the job of the prophet is there to bring you back to that revelation. He's not there to create anything new. If someone starts to read the prophets in such a manner that they see uh, that, you know what, this seems new, it behooves them to try to reinterpret it in line with the original message in Torah. Yeah. Orthodox or uh, Reformed? I'm Orthodox. Not all Orthodox Jews agree with me. There's many different streams of Orthodoxy, so I'm more of a rationalist. 
more like a Rambamist philosophical approach that you're going to have to explain that, what they mean. I mean, these people aren't coming from rabbinical backgrounds. Oh, sure. Yeah, yeah. It's a bunch of Gentiles. Come I'm on. following you, but I deal with, I'm a Christian. I'm a Jewish Christian, which you probably don't think exists. But um, I mean, at the end of the day, yeah, nobody in here would actually understand what you're talking about. I do believe in the existence of Jewish Christians. I don't believe in Jesus in any way, but I think that as long as you keep, you know, what we call the oral law and the written law, it doesn't matter if you believe the Messiah is. That's my personal opinion. Well, that's but Maimonides... Radical. Like, that's... Uh, where do you live? <laughs> yeah, it's very radical. Well, where where sure. do you live, out of curiosity? Not like exactly. Are you in, are you in New York or... No, I live in South Florida. South Florida. Okay. I'm just kind of curious. <laughs> I have not... Usually I can branch off of... You're pretty cool, Jewish, Rabbi. I know most... I mean, you would be shunned by a lot of people for what you just said. Uh -huh. So hopefully my connection is okay. But you guys, if you want to know more about what I teach, my website is TorahJudaism.com. And or just look at my name, Asher Meza, on YouTube. Hey, Rabbi, can you clear something up for us? Um, there, was a, there was a question that went to Jewish law a little while ago. And I've read enough that I think I gave a pretty good answer, but maybe you could give it to us better. So, um, so Rambam... From what I understand, in the 12th, 12th century, there was a change in how Jewish lineage was counted from the father's side to the mother's side. Is that accurate, or is that something I've just heard incorrectly? It didn't occur in the time of Maimonides. It occurred much earlier. We don't know the exact time, but there's three opinions in the Talmud in terms of what classifies someone an Israelite. Now, tribal lineage was always through the father. It's still through the father. However, what makes you legally liable to rabbinic and Torah law has been established by the rabbis to be by the mother. But there's three different opinions by the rabbis. There's one opinion in the Jerusalem Talmud that it's only by the father. Now, this is a lone voice. There's another opinion in the Babylonian Talmud that Rabbi Akiva says that it's through the mother and the father. However, the opinion that the rabbis chose to go by is the opinion of Rabbi Shimon ben Yochai, who said that it's only by the mother. Meaning that if you had tribal lineage through your father, but you didn't have a Jewish mother, you wouldn't be, for lack of a better term, a citizen or subject to the laws of the land. But that doesn't mean that you're special in any way only because you happen to have a Jewish mother. It just means that if you broke the Sabbath, the court couldn't put you to death because you wouldn't be counted as a citizen. Well, also, uh, you should put some background onto this, why this happened, because this all revolves around the persecution of Jewish people and not necessarily knowing who the, who the father is. I've heard that. But that doesn't appear anywhere in the Talmud like this. No, it, does, it doesn't appear in the Talmud, and I, I give anybody credit, but if we look just historically speaking, we can see this happened with different persecutions during those periods of time. This wouldn't have been applicable anywhere in the exile because this only frees you from the court, and the court only existed in the land of Israel. The court meaning the Sanhedrin. This was in Talmudic times and Mishnaic times. Now, back then, people weren't irreligious, so people kept their Judaism intact and they could trace their lineage back to at least a couple I mean, centuries or something. But to determine who was Jewish or not, I mean, if there was ever a doubt, they would just convert the baby. So it wasn't a big issue. But it's, yeah, it is traced to their mother. Chris, now. who asked the question out of curiosity or where did that question come from? Uh, it was a guy that hadn't been here before too much and he was just asking. The, the question was, um, you know, how can... Christians consider Jesus, um, you know, the Messiah and all this, if Jesus wasn't Jewish, because they were saying if, uh, you know, Jesus, Mary and Joseph didn't, ha didn't have intercourse to make Jesus, then Jesus wouldn't be Jewish because Joseph wasn't the father. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah, that's wrong, but okay. Well, the bigger question is, how do you consider a convert to be Jewish when he doesn't have Jewish parents? What tribe does he belong to? And we know that converts have been accepted amongst the Jewish people. So I don't even have an answer to that because the Tom doesn't mention it, but I assume they would have been adopted into some tribe. Yeah, I was going to ask you, like, would they would yeah, they that's actually a really tribe? Good would, would they have had a sponsor? Would they have had somebody that was teaching them Torah and then take part in that tribe? But I mean, like, if you're if you're a foreigner in the land and you want to become part of you know Israel, like, what was I mean? I guess my question would be, what was the ancient practice, say, you know, around the time of David? Like, let's say you moved into the Davidic kingdom and you were a Philistine and you've decided that, you know, the God of the Philistines wasn't for you. You wanted to worship Yahweh. Like, how would you go about that? Does anybody know the answer to that question? I don't think so. If for sure it's not in the Bible, converts don't appear, I mean, outside of Ruth. 
joining yourself. It says the individual who came to King David saying that he killed Saul. It says that he's Ben Ger Amaliki, that he was the son of an Amalekite convert. But no one knows. The Torah talks about the mixed multitude of peoples standing alongside the Hebrews on Mount Sinai. We call them the heir of Rav. And then they suddenly in some way disappear. They appear like maybe in the book of Numbers once, but it seems that they were absorbed into the Jewish people and probably were allotted land, but we don't know because it doesn't it doesn't say. Rabbi, I'm an agnostic and I was born to an agnostic mother who was born to a Jewish mother. Uh, by the standard of like Shuman Yobahai, am I Jewish? Yes. Nice. Yes, but that doesn't mean that you're in any covenant with God or special to God. If Karl Marx is Jewish, Trotsky's Jewish, Sam Harris is Jewish, <laughs> atheist individuals are Jewish. But that doesn't mean that they're in a covenant with God. That means that if there was another court in the land of Israel and you were abiding in the land of Israel, if you broke, let's say, the Sabbath, being warned and everything, you'd be put to death because you'd be legally Jewish. But that doesn't mean that there's any intrinsic value in that. Oh, that's not so good. Okay. So all of, all of the uh, all of the bad stuff, none of the good stuff. Actually, this is uh, just to be clear. Right. It would behoove you not to live in the land of Israel. And this, is actually, this is actually an interesting point because a lot of Christians don't. So, like, when we talk about Jewish law, and this is, uh, Rabbi, this isn't necessarily for you as much, but just more for Christians. When we talk about Jewish law, and Paul says that, you know, you're going to be judged under the law based on who you are and what you know, basically, in Romans. You know, and it's better not to be judged under the law than be be judged under under a different covenant of the law because the law is so harsh. This would be a great example of that, just so people understand. And I also think it's a good example regarding at least rabbinic law. I mean, Torah law, the same God who said don't eat pork is the same God who said don't murder. And he didn't make a distinction. But in terms of rabbinic laws, rabbinic laws are only really applicable in the land of Israel when there's a court because it was developed by the court. So, yeah, just stay out of Israel and then you're free from... <laughs> well, so here's uh, this is actually interesting. Um, I don't want to turn this into asking you every Orthodox belief you have. So actually, I'm gonna not do that. I just find it. I have never. I mean, you're almost for claiming to be an Orthodox Jew, and this is not a judgment. This like on you saying this. I just some of the stuff you're saying is very much. Um, you must just get it. You must have some people that really don't like you and uh, yeah. some fellow Jewish people. And I understand that because I have the same issue. But so, I mean, is that true? Like, do you feel like you're kind of on the outside looking in sometimes? Yeah, well, I'm a convert. I converted over 23 years ago. And then I moved to Israel and I lived there for five years. I'm still on a search for truth. And I'm not going to in some way check my brains at the door just because what I come up with is not popular. But in my community, uh, I do what everyone explains, else does. Yeah, this explains, yeah, this explains a lot. I'm just... I, yeah, I mean, yeah. the, I'm not trying to judge. I'm trying my best to be like, you're saying some stuff. I've like, I hang out in the Jewish community, and you're saying some stuff that, like, uh, I, I actually agree with a lot of what you're saying. Like, you haven't said anything I, I find uh, demonstrable, and you're cha you're actually being very honest on where you're grabbing your material from, whether or not you're bringing it from the Torah or you know rabbinically from different rabbis, which is more than you can get from a lot of Jewish rabbis. Um, I mean, this is very interesting to me. So you know, my my ears are tingling very much listening to you. Oh, cool. So I've debated a lot of Orthodox rabbis. I mean, just look me up online. Yeah. And I always found room and there's three opinions. Well, not in Orthodoxy. In Orthodoxy, most Jews kind of believe the same thing. Because I'm a rationalist, my outlook of Judaism is going to look different than a mystic. And Judaism is really split between mystics and rationalists. You know, so mystics are right. like Hasidic Jews, for example, Chabad versus yeah, a student of the Rambam. You're not get anywhere yeah. with um, anywhere we're talking, you would not get this far. With they they would have walked away by now. I mean, most Hasidic Jews wouldn't have this conversation. Yeah. So, well, this is interesting because that means you probably have a different opinion on what the Messiah would look like. Do you believe in one Messiah or two Messiahs? Most Jews don't believe in two. It's a misconception. It appears in the Talmud, but there's a lot of things that appear in the Talmud well, that, yeah, that, that, that people don't believe in. I believe in Maimonides' understanding of the Messiah, which is essentially just a human king that eventually dies and his son takes over like so, any been, monarchy. I'm sorry? So more of a Messiah Ben David? In terms of Ben David versus Ben Joseph, I think Ben David is understood as some sort of conquering Messiah. I mean, yes, he's a political figure. According to Maimonides, he brings people back to Judaism and helps build a temple. But 
he says nothing else is going to change. There's nothing metaphysical that's going to occur with the exception of Jews having religious sovereignty in the land. And that's it. So that's very different from what the Kabbalists believed. I mean, the Kabbalists believe that the Messiah will never die, that the Messiah could read your thoughts, the Messiah could levitate, that it's a perpetual kingdom. So it's very similar to what Christianity teaches. And I would say that's probably 90% of Orthodox Jews, they embrace the mystical understanding of the Messiah, which is very similar to what Christianity teaches you. Well, what, so there, not, I like this conversation. So we argue that we're gonna see two Messiahs of the same person. So we're gonna see Jesus once coming to save us and once coming back to restore us. Uh, hence you have Ben Joseph now, and then you have Ben David later on uh, when he comes back, which is interesting that you agree with that. Well. It depends how you look at it. Like we believe in one Messiah, but two times, which that's the argument we would look at and say that even even Jewish people don't think this idea is that far off. And there's plenty of, as you know, literature that goes into it. I think the question is, you know, well, I mean, the question realistically, and you've already.